Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about how to emulate a four track recording. If you are a frequent traveler of this channel, you know how much I harp on the benefits of implementing limitations in your recording studio. I think limitations are a great way to spur creativity and allow, uh, forces you to think outside the box. And I mean that in the metaphorical sense of thinking outside the box as well as the literal sense. And limitations can manifest themselves in two ways um, in your recording studio. And this is in natural limitations that are just a an occurrence of um, limitations set by the equipment that you have and the recording environment that you're in. And the second is through artificial limitations. And artificial limitations are limitations that you impose upon yourself to um, limit your capabilities during the recording process. I think both limitations can be helpful in keeping your tracks fresh and hot. And today we're gonna hone in on the artificial limitations that you implement in your recording studio. And I think this is um, very applicable in the modern doll infested recording world where people have access to endless possibilities, endless tools, endless plugins, endless tracks, endless recording times, endless, endless, endless. Everything is endless in the modern digital recording world. And by setting artificial limitations upon yourself, you are going to force yourself to have a different recording process and thus a different ending uh, mix sound. And as I said, this is a great way to spur creativity. And I hope that you can learn something from this video and implement it in your own recording process and hopefully um, come up with something new that you haven't done before. And the particular idea that we will be focusing on in the video today came to me when I was wrapping up a song on one of my reels and it was the last full length song I could fit on my uh, on the reel that I was using as there was only about 60 or so seconds left of blank tape at the end of that song and you know in a professional recording studio that blank tape would either just be left there as protection or it would be discarded or it would be saved on a separate uh, reel for future use. But I wanted to try a little something different and I thought it'd be really cool if I could split up the one inch reel that is separated into 16 tracks. Um, if I could s separate that into four four track songs and you know, thus I wouldn't be wasting this end of tape. And I had four rough ideas that I wanted to do anyway as filler um, transition type of songs from my album, Distorted Proportions, which did I mention I have an album? Oh, no. slow down there, Mario. What? What's the problem? As you know, the team and I have been up all night crunching the numbers in order to optimize your YouTube channel's performance. Yeah, so? Well, according to our calculations, self-promotion is hurting your channel. How could that be? Well, as it turns out, we received a pretty lengthy comment from user <laughs> detailing all of these criticisms. Yeah, and what are these criticisms? Well, he said that your self-promotion is tacky. Tacky? That you're driving people away. Drive people away? That every time you self-promote, it gets more and more cringe. Cringe? Oh my god, I can't believe this. So what, what are you telling me? What are you telling me I just can't talk about any of my music now in these videos? Well, we advise you not to self-promote music on your channel any longer. Well fine, I guess I just won't promote anything anymore in this video. So anyway, thank you. Moving on, I had the four tracks that I wanted to implement for this project and I'm gonna be referring to these four songs as the four track medley for the rest of this video. Um, and I knew already through like some really rush, uh, rough playthroughs that these songs were exceeding the 60 or so seconds of time left I had on the tape, but that was an easy fix. I put the machine um, in the pitch control function and slowed the tape machine to its slowest possible speed. And by doing that, I was able to squeeze some extra time left. And now all four songs of the four track medley were gonna be able to fit on the length of tape I had left. So now my next step was to record all of the individual tracks for the songs and I want to go over my thought process and recording process for each song as well as some of the individual tracks that I recorded. I think uh, we could learn a thing or two from the decisions I made as well as it might spur some creativity within you all in your own recording studio. Um, the overall theme for each of these four songs was to go for a true four track recording. and. 
As such, I wanted to impose the limitations upon myself as if I was using a four track machine while I was recording each of these songs. Meaning I didn't want to record 12 tracks onto the tape and then bounce them down later onto four individual tracks and call that a four track recording because that wouldn't be four track recording. Instead, I wanted to stick within the four track sliver dedicated on the piece of tape and I was going for a live garage band type of sound. So I didn't want to do any bounce downs. I wanted to record every um, track as it was going to be played during mix down. I didn't want to do any bouncing, any mixing of tracks um, onto singular tracks. I wanted it to be all separated for each instrument. I wanted the, the songs to be pretty bare bones and not a lot of production value. And while I wasn't necessarily going for a specific era of music, I would say I was kind of going for like a local garage band who had access to their own consumer um, four track tape recorder, maybe something like a TAC A3340, maybe something like that. And you know, that might place the time period somewhere in the mid 70s or the late 70s. Um, or maybe throughout the 80s and you know that's kind of the sound i was going for once again not really going for a specific era the compositional elements of these songs are more 60s inspired however uh, you know there's a lot of reverb on the instrumentation as well as well as the surf element another overarching theme for the four track medley is the changing drum sound between each song the other instrumentation is relatively recorded the same between each song and only very minor differences but the drum tracks um <clears throat> all have four different setups per song and my original intention was to go over each individual's songs drum sound in my garage rock drumming video but that video was getting way too long as is so i only focused on one song the new hey song and um you know i didn't go over the three other songs so Keep that in mind when you're listening to the end product. Listen to how the drum sound is going to change from track to track and look at the mic microphone configurations that I use for each and compare the differences and hopefully you could learn something from there as well. Okay, so let's start with the first song, Hang 10. The working title for this song was just Surf Jam, very uncreatively. And this occupied tracks one through four on my tape machine. And on my console, track four is routed through channel 17, just because my fourth channel on my console is a little iffy, so I don't use that one, but um, just saying that just for clarity's sake. And, you know, I was just going for a really classic surf rock jam here. There's um, tons of reverb on the guitars. I add a lot of reverb during the mix down process through my outboard reverb unit. And especially towards the latter half of the song, I am sending all four channels through that same reverb unit. So, you know, reverb. So track one was the drum track. And I had my ribbon microphone as a front of kit microphone. And that was going through my tube preamp. And I was cutting some low end around 200 hertz. I also had my EV. 635 omnidirectional microphone on the snare um, and this was being sent through my Shure microphone mixer Track two was the guitar track, and I was using the EVRE15 about six inches away from the grill cloth that was being sent through my same tube amp, and I was also combining that signal with the omnidirectional microphone, the EV635A, that was placed about two feet away from the same twin reverb amp that was being sent through my Shure microphone mixer, and <clears throat> those microphone signals were being summed together and sent through a compressor for some moderate compression, a ratio of 5 to 1, um, a medium attack time, and a somewhat fast release time. And my thought process with these two microphones is to get a really focused sound with the super cardioid microphone that's really close against the grill cloth. It's going to get a lot of the speaker sound while ignoring a lot of the room sound. And for the second microphone that's backed off the grill two feet, that's a omnidirectional microphone that's going to be picking up sound from all around the room. It's going to be um, getting most of its sound from the speaker, but it is going to be colored by the room, giving it a roomier sound. And I think by combining these two microphones, you get a really full sound. And I use this setup um, quite a bit recently for my guitar tracks.
And the third track is the bass track, and this is my usual setup of my bass guitar going through my PV amp um, and being recorded by an SM57 pretty close to the real cloth. And that is getting some medium compression. And the fourth track was the second guitar track, and this track was used for the intro dive bomb on the guitar, as well as some uh, supplemental bits um, on the rhythm section. And this was recorded with the EV635A about one foot away from the grill cloth of my twin reverb. Okay, so the next song, the new Hey Song, and this was track five through eight. Um, track number five was my vocals, and I tried many, many, many things here. I was trying to go for a live club type of sound, like a, a bar um, type of sound, and I was using my Yamaha mixer to try to get a PA sound, and I tried so many configurations, so many different microphones, so many different speakers, and I, it just wasn't sitting right with the mix, and I wound up just going with the really vanilla setup of just SM57 about six inches away from my mouth, and just singing like that. So that's what I wind up going um, with for track five. Track number six was the guitar track, and that is the same exact setup I used on track two of the previous song. And you're going to be seeing that setup uh, a lot during uh, the four track medley. Um, <clears throat> Track number seven is a bass track, same as track number three. I use a slightly higher compression ratio here for this song because I'm using a pick as opposed to my fingers. And when I use a pick, I get really rhythmic and it gets really plucky and I need to kind of even out the sound a little bit more. Track number eight was my drum track. And as I mentioned a thousand times, I talked about this track extensively in my garage rock drumming video so you know i'm not gonna harp on um the specifics here i used my low impedance radio shack microphone as a crotch mic and that picked up the sound of the whole kit and for this song i was going for like an anthem rock i don't i don't know if that's a genre but like you know something it, a crowd can chant it's something easy to follow it's just a bunch of haze a bunch of oohs and ahs and it's something to get your feet stomping crowd moving people sing along to so that's kind of what i was going for for that song <laughs> The next song is Jam Bon, and the working title for this was just Spy Song. Um, you know, for this song, I was obviously going for a spy sound. I was going for a classic 145 chord progression, nothing fancy, kind of surfy vibe, uh, kind of 60s spy type of sound. And um, on track nine, we had the drums. I had my ribbon microphone as a front of kick microphone, going through my tube preamp, cutting 200 hertz, and that was the only microphone used for that drum track. <clears throat> For track 10, that was guitar track, same as track 2, not going to go over that again. Track 11 was the organ, and I only used the lower keys on my organ for this song, and this was going through my PV amp with an SM57 up against the grill cloth with some um, moderate compression. And this is the first song I've used this organ for this purpose where I'm just looking for a bass line. I actually kind of really liked how it came out, so pay attention to that when it plays back. Track number 12 was the lead guitar, and this was just my 635A, about one foot away from the uh, grill cloth, and a moderate 
compression ratio of 6 to 1. And during mixdown is when I added all those stupid uh, sound effects with my mouth to the song. And so, you know, that's not recorded on my one inch tape machine with the four tracks. That was just recorded live while I was mixing down onto my mixdown deck. All right, next song is the Lost Organ Jam. And I originally just called this the Organ Jam while I was recording it. That was a working title. Um, track 13 was the drum track. And this was uh, the fullest sounding drum track. I used my shiny box. Uh, as a front of kit microphone, I used the 635A on the snare, and I used an SM57 on the bass drum. I was trying to get the fullest picture of the drum set um, as compared to the three other songs. And these three microphones were being summed through my Shure microphone mixer as usual. I like that setup a lot. Um, track 14 was my organ, and here I had the upper deck going through my twin, and I was recording that with the EV RE15 through my tube preamp, and the lower deck was going through my PV amp, being recorded by my SM57. Both of these were being summed and sent through a compressor with some really light compression of 3 to 1, and a slow attack time and fast release time. Really not trying to color the sound too much there. <laughs> And the track 15 was the rhythm guitar track. Once again, the EV 635A, about one foot away from the grill cloth, going through my Shure microphone mixer, uh, low ratio of three to one, medium attack time, and fast release time. <laughs> Track 16, which is the lead guitar for the track, um, was recorded exactly the same as track 15 because I wanted the end result to just kind of mend together and I didn't want to be able to hear the two separate guitars very easily. I just wanted it to be like a kind of a wall of sound type of deal. So that is what I did. <laughs> And I got a little creative when I was mixing down this song because the intro drum fill that I recorded wound up just not sitting right with me. And I listened to it a thousand times and it was on time and everything, but it just, I don't know, it didn't sound right. And it was too late for me to re-record the drum track because I had to record the three other tracks and I just didn't feel like doing that. So I just, I had to find a creative way to get rid of the intro drum track. So... And that's how I came up with the idea of starting with rewinding the tape and recording that sound of the tape rewinding onto the mixdown deck and pressing play right at the point after that drum fill that I wanted to exclude. This way the song would start right at that point. And um, so that's what I wound up doing. And, and I wound up getting lucky and timing it exactly right on the first try when I was doing that. And I actually really like the end product. And it makes it sound like it's um, a short excerpt of a longer song, um, that's why I wound up calling it the Lost Organ Jam to kind of facilitate that idea where it was, you know, just a short section of a much longer song. I also left a four bar drum break at the end of the song and that is purely because I have future plans of making like a Beastie Boys type of song where I use a drum loop and I wanted to um, use a couple bars of that drum break as a drum loop so I'm just kind of planning ahead so that's that's why I wrote in that four jar four bar drum break during the mix down process I added parallel drum compression to each of the drum tracks uh, I added some reverb um, here and there on individual tracks as needed and I was um, mixing down all of these songs onto my Tascam 22 2 as uh, mono mixes like uh, the rest of the album distortion. Mm -hmm. 
like the rest of something. I'm not going to go through the specifics of the mixing and mastering process because the last video I did, I went into brutal detail of all the things that I do for that. So if you're interested, just watch that video. We don't need to go through that again. The only difference between the four track medley and the rest of the album's mm -hmm. mix down process was that I was using the mix down deck at seven and a half inches per second as opposed to 15 inches per second. And I did this for two reasons. And the first reason was because I was going for a slightly low fidelity sound trying to mimic that homegrown garage live band type of sound like I was trying to describe earlier. And <clears throat> the second reason was because I was curious to see if I was able to use this mix down to its fullest capabilities at this slower mix down speed. And this would allow me in the future to save money on tape because I'd be using half the amount of tape for each song if I'm using the machine at half the speed. But the end result kind of told me that I had to do some significant EQing uh, prior to hitting the tape to get an end result that was equivalent to the uh, playback recordings I was getting at 15 inches per second and for that reason for the future I'm probably just going to stick to 15 inches per second it just this machine in particular colors the sound a little too much at seven and a half inches per second okay so let's listen to the four track medley in all its glory <laughs>
Alrighty, folks, that is the end result. I hope you all enjoyed the four track medley. Please let me know what you think. Remember that the point of this video is to show you that implementing artificial limitations in your recording space can be beneficial to your recording process. It spurs a lot of creativity and, um, you know, it forces you to think a different way. And I think that's an important way to learn, um, especially as a new home recorder. So I recommend it quite a bit. There's also a great tool if you're trying to emulate a certain era of music recording. And what do you guys think of these sets of songs? Do you think it sounds like a certain era? Do you think it sounds like the 60s or 70s or something like that? To me, like, the the Surf Jam, or uh, Hang 10, rather, um, I get, like, Ancient Orange vibes for that song, but the rest of the songs, I don't know. It just, it sounds like me recording in present day to me. So I would love to hear what you guys think if you think it sounds like a specific era or something like that. And if you do find yourself hesitant to implement these artificial limitations in your recording studio, I think limiting the number of tracks that you were going to record on is a great place to start. And the possibilities here are really endless with the tracks. I mean, if you have an eight track tape recorder, maybe you do two four tracks or maybe four two track songs. Or if you have a 24 tape machine, maybe you do three eight track songs. You could even do this in the digital world. You know, on my Alesis HD24, I often limit myself to eight tracks when I'm recording with my friends just to try to keep it simple and keep the, uh, you know, the live energy intact. And by that, I mean just limiting the number of bounce downs and extra production value that would go into this recording. And this idea is also possible if you're just recording on a DAW. I know the temptation must be really hard not to just record onto an endless number of tracks and keep layering guitars and stuff like that. But I implore you to try to limit yourself and stick to a small number of tracks if you're going to try something like this in your recording process. And I guarantee you, you will get something good in return. Overall, I really enjoyed this project, and I think the next time I have a roll of tape that only has a minute or so left on it, I am going to do the same exact exercise, but this time I'm going to go for a more produced four track sound where um, it's going to be a little more thought out, there's going to be some bounce downs involved, and um, you know, I'm sure I'll learn something from that process as well. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you um, enjoyed this video and I hope it influences you to close YouTube, go in your recording environment and record some tunes because that's what this should be all about. Uh, likewise, I would really appreciate it if you guys could listen to my album Distorted Proportions. Yeah, yeah, Distorted Proportions. Distorted proportions, 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 Okay, all silliness aside, I guess I should respond to said criticism because it is a valid criticism um, of self-promotion in these videos. And honestly, I didn't think this would be something people would have an issue with. Uh, but nevertheless, let's just talk about it because I want my intentions for these videos to be extremely clear. Even from the beginning when I was getting maybe 5 to 10 viewers per video, I was still promoting my music in all of those videos and with clear intention of wanting people to listen to my music. And I, I thought these types of videos were great vehicles to do so. And, you know, unapolog unapologetically so, I have continued to promote my music. And to be honest with you, when I was a little boy, I didn't imagine myself being like a famous YouTube educator star or something. I imagined myself being a musician, uh, you know, a musician playing on stage for people. And as such, I try to push myself into that route as much as possible. So that is where the self-promotion comes from. And honestly, I... I I think I should be allowed to self-promote on my YouTube channel, so I'm definitely going to keep doing so. I'm definitely um, going to be talking about my album a lot. So, 
look for that in the future. If that offends you, I'm sorry. No hard feelings to the guy who commented that. It's just, I'm going to keep self-promoting. So, that's that. Hope everyone has a good night. And let's end it with Slim Jim Joe. That's right, kids. It's me, Slim Jim Joe. <laughs>